Mike Conway, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for, uh, for making the time to have a chat with us. Fantastic, Tim. Great to be here. And I wanted to start with, so obviously you're at, uh, you're at Xventure now. Can mm-hmm. you tell us a little bit about what Xventure does, uh, your purpose, and, and I guess yeah, the day-to-day? Sure. Um, is it worth giving you a little bit of a hint about how we actually yeah. started Xventure? I think how right? to get here probably as well. That'd be great. Yeah. Okay. So um, I started Xventure at a time when I was actually uh, working at the Wiggles. So I was the manager director of the business at the Wiggles. And it's a few years ago, but probably take you back to a period where the global financial crisis happened. Yep. And I was over in America a lot, in the UK a lot. And a lot of the people I was working with at very senior positions would generally tell me that business was great. Yeah. Oh, everything's fantastic. Until in a moment of relaxation, they would then disclose to me that things were challenging, uh, which is typical of business. It's not all um, uh, smooth sailing, of course. Yeah. Yeah. So talking about that, I started to realize that as they went through that process, people who were once friends and once were colleagues were now starting to be dog eat dog. It was about Mm -hmm. protecting your home, protecting your life, protecting your family. So I came back to Australia and thought, you know, we can't do anything on our own. Uh, The only way of actually surviving and growing and building uh, and doing something meaningful is with other people, which is my original background in behavioral and social sciences. So I thought maybe what I need to do is to try and figure out how we actually uh, enable people to work more effectively in in a team environment. So that started Xventure. Um, The first thing I did was to try and create TV series, bringing corporates together yep. to focus their attention on how they work more effectively uh, in teams, through them a whole range of challenges, managed to get uh, One HD at the time and also ABC Network, Sky Business interested. And it was a revelation. People were starting to realize that actually if they can work uh, together more effectively by knowing and understanding each other, uh, you'll get much better outcomes. And that's the start of Xventure about seven years ago. And so that was drawing on your background, as you mentioned, more in that sort of the, the sciences. And, and how have you found that in terms of the application of that through obviously the, the media production, everything else that you do now? And, and what does a, a typical engagement for you look like today? Well, you know, it's, I mean, it's everything. I mean, I came to this, this part of the world because uh, I was at the time with, with um, one of the big, it was the big six at that time, of course, because yeah. it's a few years ago, but big four accounting firms. Yeah. So I was in consulting and health. So that was my background. Came here to move the kids' hospital or help move the kids' hospital from Camperdown to Westmead, which to me is one of the most complex projects you could ever imagine. You've got life-death situations. Yep. You've got highly intelligent people, all with a, with a view and a vested interest and professional um, perspective on life. So learning about how that uh, works and how you actually make that happen for the success of and, and the care of children was really important. Um, so that gives you one little inkling about the sorts of things we do. So it could well be a project related to um, a health group who are trying to uh, improve their positioning. Uh, It could be two groups have come together, a reorganization of of an organization, of of a major corporation. It could be a small, medium-sized enterprise who are not getting the cut through that they want. Or it could be a university yeah. Um, a group of MBA students, so we're actually teaching and educating about leadership and emotion and how they work together better as a team, or it could be actually working with one of the elite sports teams like the Socceroos or Sydney FC or Women's Big Bash about how they can actually get to know each other so much better, they can actually get better outcomes on their performance too. Awesome, and, and just to go back and touch on a little bit, you obviously mentioned the Wiggles, so that was a, a little bit of your time, and obviously we don't need to go too much into it, but what was that experience like, you know, sort of coming from, from all of the, the other stuff that you've spoken about, sort of going through that, that journey with the Wiggles? You know, I, I pinched myself about that period. I mean, I was there for about uh, just under 11 years, and we were really, really close. It was a connection of, of friends originally, yep. people who trusted each other to do a job, uh, lots of space to to create and develop and and the thing that that really struck me was that the rules had not actually been created so every step of the way we were doing something new mm. now if you think about the talent of the the guys themselves who started that journey of, of building the wiggles who were essentially musicians and early childhood educators that had never been done before the notion and idea of, mm. of, of delivering a message of education and learning uh, to kids through music on a stage, through a CD, 
through a DVD had never been done before. <coughs> Pardon me. And taking that then overseas into markets that no one had ever done before also was exciting. Yeah. So every step of the way, you're kind of, you know, using a lot of intuition, um, a lot of collaboration to try and find the solution because no solution existed at the time. Yeah, right. That's fascinating. And, and yeah. so from obviously you mentioned the... Uh, the work you now do with high-performing sports teams and, uh, and high-performing sports teams are probably the epitome of uh, what a great team looks like when it works really effectively together. How did, that, how did you get to working with a lot of the, uh, the great teams today? Well, it, 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 there's, there's little pieces of it, and I think that that's an interesting part of life is that you don't know what's going to happen. Mm. <clears throat> everyone, <coughs> pardon me, everyone wants that, that um, uh, control of you know what's going to happen to my life yep. you know even if you go into a meeting people want the agenda yeah they want the questions yep. uh, you know um but with a um uh, with this particular matter of, of, of sport i didn't plan it uh when i was at the wiggles i was invited to be on the board of the central coast mariners yep. because someone perceived me to have really strong brand global brand skills so maybe i could help in that and I was used to being in an executive or board environment, so I really enjoyed that because I'm a passionate soccer player, uh, soccer yeah. player, footballer, whatever you whatever you think. And then I also there's one piece. Second piece was that I was also then invited to uh, help um, the next generation of cricket coaches mm -hmm. think about strategy. Yep. So I ended up doing some work on level three coaching courses at Cricket Australia and also New South Wales cricket. So there's another piece of sport that came in, and then uh, then you then roll forward to a few years later a guy called terry mcflynn who was the former captain of sydney fc yep. uh, had been to see me uh, run an mba program with macquarie graduate school had really enjoyed it and saw it um, literally live um, looking at how we can actually immerse teams more effectively and then apparently after a couple of bad years or poor years at sydney fc uh, he gave me a call just to have a chat because we, we get on very well. Mm -hmm. And through that conversation, he said, do you know what? We're actually struggling in relation to how the team is cohesive or not, as the case may be. How do we actually bring people together? How do we improve communication? We, we've really not got that nailed. She said, do you want to come and talk to Graham Arnold, um, yeah. who I'd met a few years before again yeah. on another circumstance? Went to see Graham and Terry. There was no plan. There was no process. There was no, again, kind of wiggles fire. There was no yep. structure about how we do this. Uh, it's never been done in sport before. So essentially, they felt that they'd covered off physical, technical, tactical, which are mm -hmm. the key elements of most sports teams. But where it came down to what they would normally describe as the mental side of the game, or I, I call it the emotional side of the game, uh, they got nothing at all in relation to any programs around that. So they said, can you do it? And I said, well, let's give it a go. And so yeah. we created a process and procedure from nothing. And now it's kind of adopted at Sydney FC. You know, three years, the outcomes are really strong. And, and as we've go, gone, we've fine-tuned it, um, which is really important because the, the people change, the environment changes which is one of the critical things about sport because it's really fast moving. Yeah, and, and what is then the relation between the brain and the... Because I guess a, a lot of when you look at the emotional performance, yeah. that really impacts directly on the physical performance. So in the work that you've done and, and I guess that role of emotional resilience, how have you seen that play out particularly with sports teams? It, it's huge. It, it's, it's actually... I mean, I'm not, I'm not one that's going to sort of bang the drum and bang the drum because then you perceive yourself to have a you know, vested interest yep. and it's all about me trying yep. to get into a sports team, which I don't do. Um, but I, I actually see it as, as deeper than the, the brain, to be honest, Tim. Um, I actually look at the mind. And so if you look at the, the, the research of the mind, the mind is actually something which is much bigger. You're yep. talking about something which is, you know, uh, self-regulated. Mm -hmm. it, it changes depending on what we're learning. So we've got a new system today so we've learned some more about the new system so the next time it's a bit easier so we've got that it's also embodied so it's within us <coughs> so the mind is connected to every element of who we are yeah <coughs> so if pardon me <coughs> if if we're feeling i'm sure you can cut that out if <laughs> it's fine yeah, yeah if we're if we're feeling you know um a little hungry then it affects everything around us and that's part of the mind too you know, if we're feeling a little on edge, that affects the mind. If yeah. we wake up and we're feeling tired, that affects it. So it's embodied. But the other part of the mind to me is it's relational. Mm. Okay. So we're talking about the flow of energy and information here. So you and I here. 
Yeah. The fact that we're speaking the same language, you can then get that energy and information and then actually go, oh, I know what he's saying, yeah. and then retort back. So if you talk about it as relational, then relationships hmm. are so critical. Now, if you look at physical, technical, tactical, there's nothing related to relationships attached to that other than, come on, boys, we can do it, or yeah. come on, we can work hard in the last minute. So my interest is about how do you actually use your mind to actually build those relationships within a team environment. So that's so fundamental. Mm. And of course now, with what we're doing today, what we were born to do, which is this harmony we've got together now, this energy that's the same between you and I, Tim, is we're not doing as much as that of that. Why do you think that is? Why, why do we not do a lot of that nowadays? Well, it's interesting, isn't it? Because we've been given, we've got some great technologies, and, I, and I'm a massive supporter of technology. I'm a gizmo freak, so yeah. I love it. I saw but, the drones downstairs. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, the drones down. Anywhere, there's a drone <laughs> everywhere. Look out, you know. But, but I, I, I am, and, and so I've gone through that period of my life where, you know, I've seen a computer which you press the button and got so excited about, but then mm. you've had to go and get a cup of tea, and you've got to go and get a, a bite to eat and come back. It's not quite finished. It's it's move yeah. to a point where you press a button and it's across the ocean yeah. in somewhere else and back again. So I've seen that shift and change, and I'm excited by that. At the same time, that it's then become part of our DNA, which when we could be sitting in the same room, we're using that as a way of communicating. Yeah. When in fact, we're our communication skill set, our real DNA is about what we're doing now. Mm. And of course, when you get on a field in an elite sports environment, you haven't got the technology to communicate. Yeah. I mean, that's going to be a bit of a concern, isn't it? Yeah. You know, imagine yeah. a basketball team and they're actually... <laughs> they're actually... They're texting each other. They're texting yeah. each other yeah. on yeah. the game. Oh, yeah, I know the movie you're going to make. It's too slow. Yeah. So our relationship, the way we communicate both, you know, verbally and non-verbally and our, our reactions and our body language and everything that we say and do is going to be so fundamental to the success of the team. And that's essentially one of the key elements that I was working on. And what's the reaction been like from the players when you, you sort of talk to them about it? Because, again, as you sort of put before, is that the the general reaction from players is like, oh, it's all just like, it's about the brawn, like, you know, let's get out there, come on, lads, it's that we're all fine. But whenever you sort of seem to talk about the mind, and I think this I'll probably ask you next about general society, but particularly with a sports environment where it is much more focused on the physical than it is on the mental, what has the reaction been like from the players that you work with? You, you know, initially, of course... It depends on how you describe it. If you describe this as something which is a psychology, mm. then what tends to happen, and again, I'm going to be a, perhaps a little controversial, but I don't mean to be, is that as soon as you say, I'm a psychologist, which I don't claim I am, yep. I'm a psychologist to a young person, the first unconscious bias is probably going to be, oh, I must have a problem. Yep. So we've got, <clears throat> we've got to overcome that. Yep. So to overcome that, there's a massive rapport building. So in the early stages of this, it was quite tricky because what is this person going to do? Why is he here? What's he look like? What's he got? What's he trying to achieve? But that rapport building piece was very, very important. Mm. So I came with no vested interest, not trying to influence behavior in any shape or form. So initially we just had fun together yeah. and we had a bit of fun, yeah. which actually was simulating and stimulating the whole notion of actually teamwork, but not too, not too seriously. Yeah. What tends to happen, particularly with young people, and I've been there in a lecture theatre at, at university, again, thousands of years ago or a few, uh, quite a while ago, yeah. where a lecturer would say, so does everyone understand? And I'm sitting there thinking, well, no one's putting their hand up, so I'm not, I'm not brave enough to do that. Yeah. So we're there as a sheep. It's part of our, again, part of our, our, our human behaviour. But in fact, we don't understand. So what I found was that the young people are much more becoming and much more open when you have a one-on-one -on -one with them. Yeah. So build the rapport, team environment there's trust and then suddenly this conversation starts to happen yeah and the conversation is broadly and fascinating again the majority of the things that we're talking about here are actually off field not on field that we can mm. fit, we start to play with yeah. get that played with then it starts to then flow into the on field as well so and have they i guess have the players embraced it then have they or have they been more of that sort of a little bit abrasive like what, what's the when you sort of talk to them one-on-one -on -one, like have they picked it up and just run with it have you found people that struggle a little bit with it um yeah no question i mean some some have struggled with it uh, but the models do matter so we're trying to educate 
people on some very simple, again, I'm using the word model, I don't use it with them because model, again, seems a bit heavy. Yeah. Because we're talking about young people here whose focus on sport is not on, you know, necessarily education like this. Yeah. But um, there have been some people who've struggled a little bit with it, but you've got to work harder with, with yeah. people. They're, they're, they're all yeah. personalities, but the majority of them have been very, very open. Mm -hmm. So even yesterday, I, I got a call out of the blue. Sorry, that's not true. The day before, I got a text yeah. from, from a, a, an ex uh, international, Australian yeah. international, who out of the blue said he wants to talk about something. Yeah. Speak to him yesterday, half an hour, and one of the things that came up was this very, very significant word is trust yeah. and confidentiality. Yeah. So one on one, he can have that conversation mm -hmm. and feel that he's safe. Yep. And then we can work on something. So bit by bit. And then, of course, success breeds success. If, yeah. if you find a good person and you've met someone, what are you going to say? Yeah, they're really good. They're really nice. They're really decent. They've got nothing other than they want to help and support. And that's what's emerged yeah. out of it. So much so that from Sydney FC, we've then got to the Socceroos because, of course, Graham Arnold has taken that role. So ended up working with him there. And then more recently then with the under-17s that I find fascinating, sort of youth and adolescents so working with the under 17s yeah. who are going to the world cup why, why so fascinating with that just a different <coughs> dynamic of the age group or i think i think because the the the, the challenges are they're more that they're, they're more interested enthusiastic once they grab it yeah but the challenges are quite quite complex okay. you know they they the 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 mentality of our oh, you know am i brave enough am i confident enough to say something is mm. even deeper uh, so working with the under 17s was initially a little more challenging but once you get over that, they get it really quickly. And of course, they're more immersed, and I'm not going to be a big critic of, of technology here, but they're more immersed in the utilization of, of technologies. It's, it's, again, I've used DNA a couple of times, but it's their DNA now. Mm. You know, they, they, I was doing a session last week, for example, yeah. with, a, with a big medical group, and as I was doing a keynote, there's probably about 150 people in the room, I was watching, I was looking around, and I, I'm trying to observe, be open and observant about what's around you. And the number of, the majority of the phones that were sitting on people's laps as yep. they were talking were younger people. Yep. So the younger you get, the more phones there are out there. Yep. Just in case, just in case, just yep. in case we miss something. Yeah, exactly. Or just in case I've got to say something. The FOMO. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's got to be done. Uh, yeah, FOMO, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So you understand that and know it. But it's, it's, it's a challenge when you're trying to get focus and attention and if you can't get focus and attention for a minute how are you going to do it in 95 96 minutes within a, within a football match exactly exactly yeah. and you talked about trust a little bit before as well with the individual that you're working with obviously if we can get to that point of trust where everybody trusts one another i can only imagine that everything it becomes a lot easier yeah. is that right i mean is it well i think so i mean it's um it it's really interesting i mean trust i mean i've been working with one of the players on this whole notion of trust. So yeah. I worked, and we started off on that basis about trust. So trusting himself and trusting people around him. So once you start doing that, so what does trust mean? How do you get to trust? So it's back to what we're doing right now. Mm. It's, it's an open communication. So this, I'll give you an example. One particular moment was I, I, I went to see a match and it was an EPL game. And the person after saw it and he said, did you see what happened during the game? You know, mm. that, that shouldn't have happened. Yeah. You know, he obviously didn't understand what I said. And I said, OK, so that's interesting. Where's the, where, where are they from? And they said, well, they're quite a new player. OK, you're already starting to learn something. They're a new player. Where are they from? They're not from these parts. They're from another country. Do they speak the same language as we do? So the energy and the information flow is not the same. Yeah. No, they don't. Said, so the communication that you're transferring is a challenge because we haven't got the same agreement we haven't got the same platform yeah so how are we going to deal with that maybe i have to spend time with them mm. they haven't spent time with them outside going into a training session or on the field yep. so that then starts the process running and isn't it true that you know in corporations particularly you can be in a corporate environment and you actually will say I'm not sure about that guy in the corner. I don't like them very much. We don't get on. Yep. And so what happens when you walk through the room, as soon as you see them and they see you, there's already a tension. Yep. It's a tension created without anything being said. Mm. So all of a sudden, you're then in a two-day workshop with them, a training workshop, <laughs> and suddenly you find out, actually, they're not bad. They're a good guy yep. because you've spent time away from this specific thing, built, and then suddenly there's a trust that drops in. So yeah. there's a whole range of pieces that 
happening as a result of that. And so obviously you do work with corporates as well, as you mentioned at the start. So how much of what you've taken away, particularly with the sports teams that you work with? I mean, I guess a first question about your sports teams is that the success that you've obviously seen with the teams that you've worked with is, is quite clear in terms of how well they've all performed off the back of the work that you've done with them. So how much of that can actually be taken away into that corporate landscape and used by corporates and by teams within corporates to become better versions of themselves? You know, massively, absolutely massively. And, and, and bearing in mind that I started in health and in yep. hospitals and in corporate, and so young and then Deloitte and so on. So that's been my world. And it's actually, they're so close, it's, it's crazy, so close. You know, we're all trying to perform to get an outcome. As long as you've actually got a shared view about what the outcome is, which is quite often not the case. Yep. Uh, if we can get that, I think that with sport quite often, um, or more often than not, you actually know what that is. You is know, that as simple as to win or is it? Yeah, it's to win, but to win in a certain kind of way. Yeah. Uh, so for the Socceroos and for Sydney FC and for the better teams, Barcelona, prime example, is to win in a certain kind of way. Hmm. To win a certain kind of way, you have to play a certain kind of system. So when you are, uh, you can choose a bank or you can choose Google, or you can choose a major corporation, you can choose Helix, you know, the group that, that, that you're involved with. That all those groups, um, they've got a certain way. So to win in that way. Um, you don't want to bet the horses, you don't want to step outside your environment, which is your culture. So that's important too. Mm. So, you know, I've been involved in sport where, well, we won, but we felt a bit disappointed about the win. So yeah. the a and analytics around the win is important. Mm. And here's one thing for you from, from the Wiggles, which I think was amazing. And, 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 I, and I pride myself in seeing that and observing it. So this wasn't my... After every show that they did, and they did 200 and odd shows a year, so that's a heck that's of a lot, lot of shows. shows. Unbelievable. Yeah. I mean, 90 minutes each. And it makes a lot me of exhausted games. just thinking about it. <laughs> it, it, it. It is, and they were very fit guys, right? And, and so were the dancers. But they do a show and put everything into it. So I, I, I use that as an analogy for the sports teams. So yeah. You think you've done well, you've had a, you have a break for two days. The Wiggles were doing two yeah. in one day. But after every show, they'd come off the stage and then they would... I would describe it in the corporate sense of a post-implementation review yeah. or in the hospital health sense, a clinical audit. Yeah. And in doing that, they would straight away reflect on how they performed the show. Mm. So the outcome was great. People loved it. They all cheered. But the risk of that is you think you've won. But how yeah. did you win? And winning is finite, but I'm looking about the infinite. So it's not just about yeah. winning today. It's about how do you actually build on that and create something really meaningful for a long period. Do you think we're actually at risk of that more broadly within society because we live in such a fast-paced world where everyone is just focused on that outcome or the next outcome or the next outcome? Often we completely miss how do we actually get there to start with. Is, is, this, a, is this a major risk you think we're going to undergo, particularly as the next generation comes in as well, who have less attention than anybody else? Do you know what? I think, I think it could be, but it's about great leadership of people who actually see that, understand it, reflect on that, and build something which is actually much more meaningful than that. You mm. know, uh, I was with a, the health group last week. <coughs> Pardon me. They've been around for 80 years. So I won't mention the health group. Yeah. <laughs> if anyone goes to the health group's 80 years, they'll probably know what it is. And, and we talked about this with the executive team first. Then we went into the main, you know, all the, the whole corporation. Yep. And talking about what, what does that mean? So it confirms something along the lines that hmm. this is much bigger than just winning, you know, this, this period of time for the shareholders. Yeah. Much, much bigger. Then I then look at um, the work that I did uh, with the most amazing corporation, um, Disney. So I worked with them on off for 10, 11 years, working in the TV world in, in America, working, you know, on videos and so forth. And then you look at where they are now, mm -hmm. and then you look at the legacy of that man that came up with that idea. Yeah. Truthfully, whilst they're much, much bigger and much more corporate now, they're building and creating beautiful things for young people to see, to inspire us, mm -hmm. even today. Yeah. So that legacy lives on. So it's much, much bigger than just you know, the win of, of one movie. Yeah, for sure. And, and you mentioned young people. I know that some of your work obviously is focused more at that, at that grassroots level now. And, and I guess what makes you passionate about that specific area when you are looking at sort of particularly grassroots sports, et cetera, you know, why is it there that you think we obviously need to build more emotional resilience and agility, particularly in those audiences as we, as we get on? Well, 
I'm not sure what the chicken and egg is here, so I'm, I'm struggling a little bit with this, but let me try and try and give you things that are on my mind rather yeah. than necessarily it starts here and ends here yeah. because I, I don't know where it starts or ends. But uh, I don't feel good about 100,000 young people being on antidepressants. Yep. I just don't. And I know that that might affect people who are actually build antidepress- antidepressants, but I think there's something not quite right about that. Mm. That, you know, in my child, I had a very happy childhood and we didn't have huge amount yeah. but it was a very happy one and it's actually unfathomable to me to think well why yeah. what's happened here um, so I'm really interested in figuring out that we can have a happy life without that yeah I'm sure that it's not in the long term going to do people good to be sitting on, 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 a, on a drug called an antidepressant so I think that's that if we look at things like youth suicide both in New Zealand and Australia um, it, it, it's really concerning you know mm. my family are involved in in health and involved in caring yeah you know both in ambulance service and police and also in, in 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 medicine and so it's a constant so i'm thinking okay if that's the case if we can actually think about well, what is it that's really going on and i don't have the answers to everything here yeah maybe we can provide some skill sets to overcome some of these things so mm. one of the key things to me is actually acknowledging and realizing that we're not on a happy pill every moment of the day. Yeah. That actually we do go up and down. That you know the old you know the old analogy. It's a roller coaster. But actually reflecting on the downs, understanding what happened on that down moment that we didn't win, and then utilizing that as a piece of information, learning, and then get on the up and enjoy it again. Yeah. That's what I'm trying to do with you know schools programs that we're doing, and also with students at university, and also with with uh, with football or anyone that's really cares to be interested. And I think it's such a uh, such a great thing to be doing because I mean even as a uh, I guess a new father still you know relatively my my son's two and a half, but I feel the divide is so great between even what my generation went through. Uh, in terms of like we didn't have a lot of technology at the time it wasn't you know a lot of this stuff we didn't have to sort of deal with I, I hear horror stories now already of of some of my um, my friends who have got you know kids who are now going through school and just what they have to go through I think it's um quite frankly it can be a little bit terrifying so do you think that there's also an element of the parents not being equipped enough as well I mean is that why I guess the focus at the grassroots level and directly with that end user is so important do you think there's an element of having to to deal with parents and equip them for what they need as well no, no question it, 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 it to me you've just hit the nail on the head and, and I don't I, I hand on heart mean that so I'll give you an example and again I can only go off examples so yeah. I, I like to do empirical so mm-hmm. rather than talk and just go yeah this is what I think I said can we test that out so we created it's there actually we created <clears throat> a tv show so i yeah. just I, I constantly think well rather than just sitting talking about it and telling someone else to do it why don't we do it ourselves and and, and prove it so the tv show which was x venture family challenge and it's not a, a push for that particularly was built to try and get parents and kids and, and teenagers to work together and yeah. see whether or not we can learn some things around it. That's really what it was about. Yeah. So we start off in New Zealand, 16 families, threw them a whole range of challenges, which was fun. Yeah. And <clears throat> through it, it wasn't really about the winner who did win, you know, one family won in the end. It was about families learning together, mm. being together, staying together, playing together. Yeah. But it was really interesting to see how they did that because we gave them a resilience program at the beginning and it was the parents saying, I never even thought about this. Yeah. And then started to see their youngsters leading them in certain things. So that was really good. Yeah. But things came out of that. So as they arrived on TV, and I know there's a bit of conversation going on in the media about this now. We, this is two years ago. We didn't plan it, but we actually said, you know, they're going to be on set. What we're going to do is when they arrive, we'll just have a bag and we'll take all their phones off them. Yeah. Right. And that was, to be Enough honest. to terrify any young individual, right? <laughs> and, yeah, young meaning parent too, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, true. I'd so, be terrified. Yeah, so, so this is what was interesting because we did it purely to protect ourselves from, you know, you know getting the sound right. Yeah. You know, JC's yeah. there, they're making sure the sound's right. We were trying to do it for that reason. Unbelievable. We got it all on camera and the responses for the majority of people, we're like, oh my God, what's going on? And yeah. what, what for how long? And how long do I not get it? And we've got excuses from all over the place about why they needed their phones, yeah. right? all sorts. And, so, and there were a couple of medical ones, which is fair enough, but the excuses were amazing. And it, you know, the AFL's on tonight, do I not get to see this and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> all sorts of things. 
But what was happening was in the first day, and this is kind of a generic comment, first day, irritation. <clears throat> By the night, more irritation and it really lifted up it was like a change management program wow. and then by the second or third day there were people coming saying i'm really enjoying not having my phone mm. so it took a period now we can kind of say oh yeah that's cool of course why wouldn't we know that but it took a period of time yeah. so to me there's an addictive piece attached to this without question yeah other scientists have proven this i think well that I'm, reaction you're talking about is similar to you giving up coffee or alcohol or whatever right so, get a headache yeah and these, there were tears, there were tears. But then what right. we had, and this is the parent thing, which was fascinating. Parents were then actually coming to justify the reason why their teenagers needed their phone mm. during this period. Not actually saying, look, this is something that actually is important. So they weren't educating their teenage kids to overcome this. They were actually telling us that they need to actually have their phone. Yeah. So back to your point, there is a shift here that, you know, it, it actually, I can't cope with the addiction. Yeah have the phone quick yeah and so we do need to do that um, and the more and more we can actually influence parents around that that's fine maybe there is some connection with that we're all so busy yeah what were we working I suppose you know it was a seven half hour <laughs> day contract for five days a week it's not like that for most people these yeah. days yeah or a lot of people so they're doing 12 hour days or whatever coming back as long as the kids happy in the corner yeah it's okay yeah. So we've got to work on this. And it's, it's a lot of work. Yeah, you know? for sure. Yeah. It is. And I think, well, I mean, on that, on that note then of a lot of work, what is like one key takeaway? Obviously, we've looked at sort of the relationship between parents and kids, but one key takeaway for a lot of people who are trying to build more emotional resilience, particularly when they're sitting in an office, stresses, you know, hitting them from left, right and center, making them feel like they've got the fight or flight experience going on, despite the fact there's no line in the corner. It's actually just their boss waving a finger at them. What is one thing that you think people should take away today to try and help start building that path of emotional resilience? Right, well, can I, I, one which is connected to the other one, and mm. I, I don't know if this is the right one, but it's one anyway. Yeah, yeah, um, and that is the one that came to mind was, where I quite often start is, strangely enough, on rest yep. and relaxation. So actually getting that balance right. So actually get people to notice rest and relaxation. Yep. So again, about five or six years ago, I, I wrote a piece about sleep. So someone was talking to me about it and I just sort of sat and watched and observed this group that I was working with and they were so, they, they looked tired. Mm. They actually looked tired. And you could see that they were okay, they were all fired up, the coffees were all over the place. Hey, I like coffee too. Yeah. But there were coffees all over the place and we need another one and we need another one, we need another one. And then they were up and down like a yo-yo and by the time they got to lunchtime, they were gone. Yeah. Right, and so I started asking them. So, how do how do you sleep? And by the way, this is something that I work really hard on with some of the some of the boys and some of the girls in, in elite sports teams to try and get that piece right. Particularly if you're travelling all around the world, you know, you're sleeping in different beds and you you know all those sorts of things. When you've got young kids, yep. how do you get the pattern right? You you definitely need it. This mm. is an evolution thing. It's not yeah. me saying it, but working on rest. And so during the day, it's important we take a bit of time out. People now having lunch, not taking time out for lunches, etc. It's really, really critical. And that's where the thing is, because our brains and our minds do need to shut off from these things. Yeah. Um, so teaching and learning, and, and people talk about mindfulness. I, I like Dan Siegel, S-E-G-E-L from UCLA, who talks about mind-sightedness, because there's a relational piece attached to it, not just mindfulness. Yeah. So with mindfulness, it's fantastic, but you're in yourself. Mm -hmm. What I like to do is getting people doing things together yep. and being mindfulness and mindfulness, I suppose, as a team. Yeah. So getting that is important, you know, uh, and you can then translate to an elite sports team. So I actually try and teach um, this within 20, 30 seconds, because yeah. you've got to be able to do it in 20, 30 seconds. You're feeling on edge, taking a penalty, taking a corner. How do you do it in 20, 30 seconds? Yeah. Not easy, but if you can start by two or three minutes, taking time out of the day, and you need great leaders to say that's important too. Yeah. That's really the one. Mike, thank you so much. Uh, I really, really enjoyed our chat. I so feel like there's so many other areas that we could explore, but, um, yeah. but thank you so much. I really appreciate your time on the show. Oh, Tim, it's been a pleasure. It's really cool. Thank awesome. you. And uh, for all of our audience, we'll, uh, we'll put some of the links that Mike talked about to the, uh, the different people that he referenced uh, and also just a link to his profile as well so you can learn a little, a little bit more about him and also Accenture as well. Thank you again, Mike. Thanks, Tim. Awesome. Cheers. Cheers.